This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G-E-T-A-R-C-H-I-T dot com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. Before we begin, if you are a regular listener and enjoy these episodes, please use the subscribe button on YouTube and in your preferred podcast app to let me know that you're a fan of the show. Your subscription is incredibly valuable in supporting my efforts, and I genuinely hope that you are finding the conversations published here enriching for yourself and valuable for the AEC industry. Being a subscriber, which is completely free, directly influences two things, my ability to attract sponsors and help keep the show going, and my ability to attract high-profile guests, which is great for you. My goal is to provide value to you and the industry as a whole, so if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. As I mentioned, it is completely free and a great way to support this show. Okay, in this episode, I welcome Peter Mitev back to the podcast. Peter is the Vice President of Solutions for Designers at Chaos Enscape. In this episode, we discuss his journey from working in architecture to focusing on technology in the AEC industry, his move to Germany as his role has evolved at Enscape, some of his philosophy about AI and its potential for architects, the democratization of tools and the superpowers they provide to users, and the release of Enscape for the Mac, which I am really happy to see because I love working on my Mac. And I'm particularly excited that Enscape is indeed working in Rhino version 8 on the Mac. Can't believe I'm saying those words all at the same time with the latest preview release of Enscape. I don't even think that this is currently an option in the Windows version of Rhino 8, much to many users' dismay, but it only seems fair to me as a Mac user who has waited oh so long for these apps to come to the Mac. I say that jokingly, of course, or maybe not. Anyway, I've read on the Enscape forums that support for version 8 of Rhino on Windows may be coming in mid-February. Anyway, this was a fantastic conversation with Peter, and I hope you'll not only find value in it for yourself, but that you'll help add value to the profession by sharing it with your network. And now, without further ado, I bring you Peter Mitev. Peter, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I'm excited. Yeah, it's been, uh, let's see, it was end of March 2021 that we last talked. I'm ch checking my notes here. So it's been a couple <laughs> years almost. I mean, a lot has happened. And, and I was looking back through the show notes for that episode and just to remind m myself about what we talked about. And then we've seen each other in person a couple times since then at various trade shows. But you were... Let's see. In that episode, you talked about leaving practice, going to work mm -hmm. in tech. You were going to move overseas, and Enscape 3.0 had just come out. Right? <laughs> so Exciting times. That was, kind those of, were. That, that was the state of the of of Peter's union back then. So, where what what's happened? Catch us up over the last couple of years. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, it, it feels like just yesterday we had that conversation, but it's it's crazy to hear that date come out of your mouth because it really was right. that that long ago. Yep. Uh, so what's what's the state of the union today? Well, uh, Enscape 4.0 is about to come out, which is another really really big uh, milestone for us. It's it's something that we've been working towards for for a long time. It's exciting that we get to bring our 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 product to a lot of people that. I mean, before just haven't had a chance to interact with it, namely, namely the Mac users. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been really, really special. And on my side of things, I mean, I did, I did complete the move to overseas. I, I get to, I actually live about 15 minutes from headquarters, um, just walking. Really, I don't even drive or need to ride a bike. So that's super exciting, just to be able to interact with everybody super frequently. And 
of course, being here also allows me to fly to our other offices, you know, Sophia Copenhagen. So uh, very exciting to be surrounded by a lot of really, really passionate and, and very cool people. Like that's that's really the best part of, of chaos now that we're together. And um, I don't know, I'm looking forward to a lot more of that. So the chaos acquisition merger happened since we've talked last as well, officially on the podcast. And it seems like a really nice compliment. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that just to set up why, why did that happen? Catch us up on that part of the story as well. Yeah, sure thing. So it was a, a merger between Chaos and Enscape. And like you said, uh, completely complementary, not just from a product perspective, but I think also from a, from a people perspective. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. historically, people have always kind of asked me before the merger, I mean, you know, like, what, what are you going to do about uh, V-Ray or Corona? And my answer was maybe not the one they wanted to hear, but my answer was always like, I'm, I'm not even competing with those people. We're doing completely different things, uh, which yeah. is perfectly fine. And and we are, you know, they've, they've historically always focused on uh, super high quality, you know, things that are ready to be put into a, an Avengers movie or a Star Wars movie, Game of Thrones, right? Just the mm. absolute bleeding edge of of graphics and technology, which is awesome. Uh, but it's it's you know for for some people it's it's not accessible just because it it requires such a huge body of knowledge to to use. Whereas our priority uh, at Enscape has always been to to actually serve the other uh, side of the industry is the people that don't have time to learn this immense body of knowledge. Whether it's an architect, interior designer, or landscape designer, doesn't matter. But you know people whose day to day job is building buildings or parks mm -hmm. or infrastructure. So yeah, it's been completely complementary from from that side of things. There's very little um, conflict or, or overlap, whatever you want to call it, between the different products. And and honestly, the only other exciting part that I want to highlight is, is the people, uh, because we work on different things, but we're all very motivated and everybody's uh, super positive and, and they're, they're thinking about the right things. You know, we, we don't get distracted by um, some of these other kind of little niggling problems that I think plague bigger organizations. So it's, yeah, it's been awesome. And we've got a lot to figure out still. Don't get me wrong. This is never an easy process, but it's, I think it's one absolutely worth doing and I'm super glad we did it. It, it seems like there are the kinds of mergers and acquisitions where we've seen this happen, play out in AEC tech plenty of times with a big company buying a small company and just making it go away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's, what what we're seeing here, which is like no pump money into that product line so that it can grow and meet more users where they are. And I, I think, you know, one thing that you brought up in that was was that when I think about V Ray, when I think about the high end visualization products and I think about operating that product, I think about somebody sitting behind a cockpit dashboard. Right. I, yeah. I, that's what I, I visualize that. It's like there are so many switches and so many variables and you have to know what all of those different, it's a very different vocabulary than what an architect is trained under. And so it's like, you've got diffuse this and you've got specular that, and you've got normals and you've got all these, you've got all these global illumination variables and you know, you've got all this bounce number and it's like, to, to an architect, none of that makes sense unless you really do a deep dive and become a specialist. And V-Ray already had a foothold, definitely, in the architectural, in the AEC space, in high-end visualization. But that meant there were very few users in firms who actually knew how to use it. A lot of times they came from a visual effects background and were now moving into architecture um, and, and vice versa. I've also seen people who are working in visualization at firms go on to work at high-end visual visualization houses that take that even farther, right? Um, like Jason Addy at Neoscape has been on the, the podcast before and a couple of the other Neoscape guys too where they're doing super high-end stuff where it's like they're doing that to win work at the highest level. They're helping firms win work at the highest level. And then there's firms who have that one or two visualization specialist, if they're lucky to have that position. And Enscape was like everybody else who actually just needed to pump out high quality enough and super high quality images 
on the day-to-day basis. And I think one thing that, you know, Roderick Bates has been on the show before, you've been on the show before, and I, I know this topic has come up with other people as well, which is now we're using the tools as a design aid. We're using it to make decisions along the way. Now it's not the end of the process, which it used to be. Anytime it was V-Ray, it was the end of the process, right? It was because it had to be. It was so technical. And now we're using it way earlier along the path of design to help make decisions along the way because we've also seen the shift to basically renderings are free now, right? It's like it's like with, with BIM, drawings became quote unquote free because we had we, we built a model, we automatically got the sections, we got the plans, we got the RCPs, all those things. And now with real time rendering, it's like we're always visualizing in 3D. We're always visualizing in a shaded beautiful environment with a tool like this it really helps just crank out images and we're constantly because as an architect clients were always asking for rent updated renderings and it was like no you only get those at the end of dd that was when you got them because (laughs) that was when the design had settled down enough for us to spend the time to do it and now we always wanted to give them more renderings we would have as a designer i want my building to always be evolving i want the imagery of that and and I couldn't even provide that to myself, let alone to them, right? So now it's free. And so the landscape has really shifted over the last, I don't know, five or plus years. But man, what a difference. It's it's so so that that merger really does make sense. And for Enscape to grow in the way that it's grown and provide the tools to designers that it does. It's just been one of those things that's been really fun to watch because people really enjoy using that tool. It's not a tool that they feel like they tolerate and they have to put up with using. Like They really enjoy using it. They want to spend their time there. And because of that, they're plugging it in earlier and earlier and earlier and using it to make design decisions along the way. I, I'm curious what you think about all that. I think that's that's really really spot on. And honestly, when I when I talk about uh, Enscape, whether it's internally or, or externally, the the positioning that we always aim for is that it's exactly that. It's it's a design tool. I mean, if mm. of course, if you want to use that to generate some uh, renderings for a presentation, you know, we're, we're not here to stop you doing that. But when we when we think about you know what we call a product strategy or product principles, when we uh, basically build the foundation that allows us to decide and prioritize on features at the heart of it is is being a, a design tool and helping people reach a decision you know and then the quote that people have heard me um, you know parrot around the office like a broken record is that Enscape is supposed to enable design decisions not design artifacts right and design mm-hmm. artifact yeah. meaning a pretty picture, a pretty video. Again, it's not to say that you can't and shouldn't do that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But uh, when we think about really prioritizing things and and it's a hard thing, right? Because we have no shortage of, of options to build things that people want, but we have to make tough decisions and say, hey, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do that. And mm-hmm. when it comes to those tough decisions, that's always what we think about is prioritizing the decision-making process and making sure that we put in things that help that process. And yeah, are there a ton of things we could do to make it uh, prettier and more realistic? Absolutely, yes. But then again, we're also lucky enough that we've got a lot of other things in the portfolio that uh, can do that, frankly, better. And it's our job then to connect those workflows and to make that as easy as possible. But absolutely, we want to enable design decisions. That's that's the absolute goal of the product. Yeah. And you come from a background in practice, so you know what it's like. You were on the tech side, and you were when when you were working in the practice. Can you do you re, like think back and what was it actually like back then versus the kind of ideal scenario now? Yeah, it was it was quite different. I mean, I was I was very lucky that I my my education, my masters and my bachelors were set up a little bit differently in, in the sense that, you know, we got to basically it was alternating one semester of, of studies and one semester of uh, professional practice, which oh, was wow. super challenging. But it also exposed me from a very, very early point to practice. And I got to see that evolve over Oh geez, it's hard. It's hard to say that it's over a decade now. Like, I, I feel old. Um, oh, but ouch! It, you're it, hurting me. You're, you're, you're hurting me <laughs> even worse by saying that. <laughs> oh no! Uh, let's stray away oh from God. that. But um, ten whole years. What? <laughs> it's it's been a heck of a. But look, even in ten years, it's been a heck of an evolution. I I remember my yeah. first job. 
I was I was drawing 2D in AutoCAD, and you know what? That was more than good enough. But um, when I think about what could have been, right? I mean, I look at how people are working today when I talk to clients, and it's 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 so different. I mean, as, as soon as you move a window or or delete a wall, you can absolutely in, in literally in real time show your client the implications of that, mm -hmm. uh, show your coworkers, make a decision, and ideally make a better decision, right? And again, I contrast to that to that first job where I was just living in AutoCAD, and I had no idea what it meant if you delete, you know, a set of lines that comprise a window. Um, what does it mean to the actual space, the quality, the experience, right? The the natural light. There, there's so many criteria that um, you can try and interrogate in your head. And if you're a really good and experienced architect, maybe you're successful. But me, I was a complete beginner and a junior back then. I was still learning. I, that was way beyond my my computational means of of my head to to analyze that and to make the best decision possible. So um, it's it, it's come a long way, and it's it's exciting. And it's exciting when I hear people that actually use the tool talk about it too, because it, it's always one thing when we plan in house, but then to hear real stories about real projects that that really live that, um, it, it's super inspiring, honestly, and it helps us know whether we're on the the right track or not. This episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. Enscape is a plugin software that simplifies real-time visualization for us in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Whether your go-to design application is Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD, or Vectorworks, Enscape lets you instantly create high-quality renderings by syncing data from your 3D model without additional import or export needed. Easily navigate every aspect of your design in real time and identify and resolve any issues you come across quickly. Plus, you can immerse your clients in VR to provide a tangible sense of the project. Enscape is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. They are soon launching something special that will make your 3D workflow the best 3D workflow for a special price. In the meantime, you can experience it for yourself for free at chaos-enscape.com slash trial-14 or simply by Googling Try Enscape. Thanks to Chaos Enscape for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. So I, I'm thinking as you're speaking about deleting walls or what do the lines mean? I mean, that's been a big shift, I think, when you think about people who operate BIM, like we had CAD mm -hmm. operators, now we have BIM operators. And back back in the day when we drew pens, graphite on paper or then switched to CAD, there was still this, this big leap that we had to make, which was what does this line mean? What does it represent? Mm -hmm. Why are we drawing it? I think that that gap has shortened quite a bit in moving into 3D modeling as a basis of the design. And then we derive all of the elevations and the plans and the sections from that because we can look at it in 3D and understand it. But I would love it if you could explain, I mean, let's do a mini word-based workshop right here. <laughs> we're, we're not showing anything, but I would love it if you could explain kind of what a design process could be like when you incorporate real-time rendering into that. And I'm just kind of thinking of, moving walls around while having this synced 3D rendered window up and actually, you know, moving the sun around while it's happening and understanding what's going on with the light in that room. Maybe you can just paint a picture yeah. for somebody. Yeah, I think the, I, I certainly can. And what I'll say is that I think it also looks a little bit different based on the, the phase of, of design that you're on. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the earliest stages, we're, we're thinking here pre-design or schematic design. I think the the real power is that it, it it lets you move very quickly. I mean, those are the shortest and the cheapest phases, right? So it means that we we typically don't have a lot of time to spend there, which is unfortunate because a lot of the big moves and the big decisions also kind of get made there. I mean, the, the, the form, the massing that you build at that stage is nine times out of 10 what ends up being the, the final thing or at least close enough. So in those stages, I think it allows you to very quickly test a lot of different options because mm -hmm. you can basically be playing around and just periodically take a screenshot. You know, at the end, you can show all that to your coworkers or your client. And you've evaluated a lot more options. And then, like you said, you also have a lot of different data points available to you, right? You could play with uh, the sun. You can play with 
the natural surroundings. You can interrogate this design from a lot of different perspectives that before um, would have taken so much time. I mean, you know, <laughs> imagine what uh, doing sun studies without real-time rendering or, or some kind of graphical computational means. It's, uh, right. it's just not something you can do for a lot of options. Um, and then I think as you, as you move and add more detail, or again, talking, I don't know, uh, design development, construction documents, then I think it also allows you to think more critically about the, the layers of specificity that you're, you're putting on a project. You know, if it's a flooring material, wall material, whatever it might be, glazing, uh, mm -hmm. Again, I think it, it lets you have a much more accurate picture of what that thing's going to look like when it's actually put up on site. Because I remember when I was working at uh, Kieran Timberlake in, in Philadelphia, we used to do a lot of physical mock-ups in order to have that sureness and that security um, that this thing is going to look like the way we intended to when it's built, right? And, and that's a great process. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not bashing the process, but it's also very expensive and time consuming, which makes it prohibitive for a lot of projects. And that's unfortunate where with real time rendering, okay, you're not going to be a hundred percent photo real, but you're going to be close enough that you can have a lot more certainty when you go in front of a client or an engineer or whoever it might be in terms of a stakeholder and say, Hey, this is what it's going to look like when we actually spend money on real materials and mm -hmm. physical labor to install this thing. So um, it's, I don't know, for, for me, it's, it's changed the workflow uh, completely. If, if people do use it as a, as a design tool, which more and more are, um, it gives you a lot more power, I think, as, as the designer and the, the, the master builder of, of the project gives you a lot more uh, confidence as well. There's a couple of different things that I, I want to just zero in on here. And one of those things is, yeah, you can move around your project and you can look at sun angles and the things that you would typically do even with traditional rendering, rendering being, you know, 3D rendering, uh, where it's like, yeah, move the camera around, change the angle, change the field of view, move the sun, get the shadows where you want them, even if it's not the right side of the building. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when we did visualization, we did that because we wanted to show off that side of the building and it would just look really bad if it was dark in the shadow, right? But now it's like, it's so easy just to move the sun by using keyboard shortcuts. As you're looking at a scene to get that right where you want, you can actually move the sun along its path and you can position your project wherever it is in the world to get realistic, but then you can just move it around and, and actually study it. But I think what's so interesting about real-time rendering is actually that you can have that window up when you're building the model as well. And you're getting near real-time, if not real-time, depending on the, the hardware, and maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit, but updates as you are moving walls around, as you are extruding walls, as you are making openings bigger or smaller. And so kind of really just zeroing in on this, making decisions during design because you're getting that visual feedback. It's not like you're just still building the model in plan view or in section view, and then you're looking at it, or then you're gonna go explore it, but you can actually be in a space. You could set your camera down in a space, and then you can go over to this view over here in whatever tool you're using, albeit, you know, it could be Revit, it could be SketchUp, it could be Rhino, it could be whatever, and you can actually move that wall and watch the implications in real time of what that's doing to the space. I mean, is, is that my painting an accurate picture there? Yeah, very accurate, very accurate, and it's it's. I guess I don't. For, for me, it's it's hard to really verbalize and quantify the impact uh, mm -hmm. for for somebody that that hasn't worked in the field. I think for those of us that have worked in the design field, we can we can imagine the the power that that gives you. But you know, for for people that haven't been involved in that process, I think it's kind of hard to quantify how important that is um, mm -hmm. because there are so many different factors, you know, and. When I give talks here and there, especially to, to crowds that are not using this kind of technology, the example I always use is is moving around uh, something as simple as a window or changing its size, right? Because, I mean, on one hand, there's the aesthetic criteria, right? Like, how does this look? Which, mm -hmm. very important, very valid. But you can really dive deeper and deeper into that that simple or seemingly simple question and say, okay, well, if I make the window smaller... 
what does that also mean for my electrical lighting? Do I need to introduce more electrical lighting? Do those fixtures clog up the ceiling? Does that mean the engineers have to come up with a new electrical plan? So, and, and these seemingly small and simple things really snowball into complex things, potentially expensive things. And, and the, the, the power of real-time rendering is that you can, you can uh, really evaluate those a lot quicker and engage other people, right? Because it's never a solo process. We, we know that architecture is not a solo process. And, and it, it helps you communicate to people which, again, may or may not have your training and your background. But the, the beauty of a picture is it's kind of like a universal language. Anybody can look at that and say, okay, well, I understand what mm -hmm. you mean. Uh, because if you just saw them, show them a 2D plan or a section, I mean, you know how it goes with people that aren't trained the way that we are. They're like, uh, it's tough for them to engage. And it's completely, completely makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, so. Okay, so you keep opening up like different pathways for me to go down. Um, the, I'll just tell a quick little story before I get to the, the other point, because I, I do want to talk about the client's reaction or the potential in, in the process right there. And which I've I've also talked about, I think, with Roderick uh, Bates on the podcast before. But but before we get there, I just want I was teaching a course at Cal Poly uh, with on emerging technology, and this week's um, curriculum was about real time rendering, and we had talked about Enscape because I had some visualization pros come in and show what you can do with VR, what you can do with rendering, and it was kind of the state of the art of of where things were headed. And I think at that time. The students were all, this is maybe 2017, 2018, everybody was, was very much embedded in whatever their professors knew, right? And so their professors knew Rhino and V-Ray. That's what they were saying. You all should be using this. Imagine telling a student you, you need to learn V-Ray in the last two weeks of the course, right? It, it would just be, like the renderings would probably look bad. And and it would just be completely overwhelming on top of an already un overwhelming task to just finish your design by the, the end of the, the quarter at that point, right? So I introduced real-time rendering to them, and it was Enscape at that point as well. And it, so I don't know what version it was. It was probably in the twos or whatever. But it was like this was one of those things where it, it was literally weeks away from the end of the course, and I had students come up at the end and they say, I, I learned Enscape, and, and just to give people an idea, if they're not using this technology, what it's like to actually pick up a new tool, because oftentimes that can feel overwhelming. That can feel like what those students felt when their teachers told them, their professors said, use V-Ray. It would just be like, what? No, right? We're not doing that. Or I only know this way, which was another tool that I've used, and I know how difficult that and time consuming that is. If you could just maybe before we jump into the other part about clients, talk about what is the learning curve for a tool like this. So because my students picked it up in literally a couple of weeks and they were doing their final presentations in it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great to hear. I mean, we we like to one of our product principles again, and one of our product philosophies is to try and flatten that learning curve as much as possible. I mean, the and it all kind of starts with with the first experience, right? The first point of contact. So w one thing that we really try to um, prioritize is the experience when you first hit that render button, because right out of out of the box, it should look good enough. We, we, we shouldn't expect people to, to invest mm -hmm. a lot of time and energy. And out of the box, I think if, if today anybody listening, if you just download the software, download a free trial version and just click render, I think you would be more than pleasantly surprised about how, how good it looks. And, you know, it, it sounds simple enough, but it's actually quite complex. And our, our engineers uh, work with our, with our customer support folks closely, and they spend a lot of time on this to, to fine tune those settings that are most likely to work out of the box because every project's different. And, and we've learned that the hard way, right? But um, it's, it's important to make sure that out of the box, it's gonna, it's gonna meet your needs. And of course, if you wanna invest more time in and, and get better and better results, you absolutely can. And, and we encourage that. We've got a lot of learning resources, but um, the learning curve should be I mean, ideally non-existent because, again, uh, you and I that have been in professional practice, we know that there's enough things going on in your day, in your week, in your month that you, most of us don't have the luxury of time or resources to invest in learning something completely new. So this kind of has to be, um, it almost has to come for free with the work that we're already getting paid to do because 
you know, at, at least in, in, in the United States where most of my professional practice is, you get paid for, for drawings. You don't get paid for renderings. You need to do them to facilitate the process of getting the drawings. But realistically, an architect gets paid for drawings. And, you know, with a couple of firms that I've worked at, we've done this uh, profitability analysis in terms of measuring billings and kind of doing, doing a correlation with what people are spending their time on. And guess what? Big surprise. Uh, when people spend more time in the tools that actually generate drawings, the projects and the firms are more profitable. The more time they spend in things like PowerPoint or Photoshop, uh, the margins are, are smaller. And it, mm. it, it has broad implications, not just for the bottom line of the business owner, but also for, for the well-being of, of the people that work there and, and the projects that they work on. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. In a world where precision meets creativity, where every line drawn holds the power to innovate, people like you are shaping the future. But let's face it, in the realm of design, the unknown is your least favorite companion. You've been stranded on the island of inefficient software, lost in the fog of endless searching for the right content. It's time to embark on a new journey, a journey to clarity, efficiency, and design excellence. It's time to get off that island and away from the unknown. Introducing Avail, the beacon in your design odyssey. Say goodbye to the daunting 10 to 20 minutes wasted per search, the costly interruptions in your creative flow. With Avail, your team will zip through content discovery, focusing more on designing and less on searching. Imagine a world where you can stop constantly fighting the costly fires caused by pulling content from past projects, building from scratch, or relying on personal libraries. Avail isn't just a tool, it's a revolution for AECO firms. Organize, manage, and navigate your project information with a leader that's proven in reliability, relatability, and success. Join the ranks of the top AECO firms who've already chosen Avail. In just 30 days, you could deploy Avail and witness a dramatic reduction in costly design errors. Whether it's your first CMS or you're considering a switch, there's someone you should meet. Will Rouse, your guide to all things Avail. Schedule an appointment and explore Avail's capabilities, onboarding programs, and professional services. Don't let your designs be clouded by inefficiency. Clear skies are just a click away. Go to getavail.com slash stranded and book a meeting with Will to start your Avail journey today. Avail, where your best design is just a search away. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel Podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah, it, it, I remember I've used a lot of rendering tools over the years and kind of dating myself, right? It was like first 3D studio in DOS and it was like FormZ, RenderZone, Electric Image, uh, Cinema 4D, V-Ray, Maxwell Render. Never once when you fired up that rendering engine did it look good immediately. Yeah. Never once. And the difference between an amateur and a pro was that. You knew if you got a, a good looking image right when you fired it up, a pro was behind the wheel. Either they had done all of the work over probably months, if not years, to set up a template for that file so that as soon as you hit the first render, it looked decent, right? But man, what what a difference. And and so I think like there's value in that. There's that just the speed in which you can spin up this kind of a a value add to your practice is basically non-existent. Like there's no, there's no time frame in which like you just hit render and boom, it's, it's, it looks decent. It looks good enough. It's something that you would not be embarrassed to put in front of a client. And, and it's just amazing to watch that transformation happen over the last decade in visualization and bring those tools to mere mortals. And I'm pointing at myself <laughs> like a, any, any architect who, needs to show what's going on in that in the project while it's still being figured out in the computer um is it's kind of a godsend to, to people like us who are just like no i don't want to sp learn how to fly the jet i just don't right. I, I don't have time to learn how to fly the jet so i just want to push this button and and there is value in that and it costs money it caught like that it's not free and it shouldn't be free I know Enscape's prices have gone up over the years, and it's gotten more complicated. Um, but but the val and so maybe you can just speak to this. Like, how do you guys talk about the value? When I mean, I think we probably already covered a lot of it. Is there anything else that that you really point at and say, like, what's that worth? Because yeah. I think 
I think architects are cheap. I think, I, and I've said that on this podcast before, architects are cheap. They don't want to pay for more tools, right? And so a lot of times they're going to try to bundle these all into one application. So whether that's SketchUp with just its free, you know, shaded views or Revit with its free shaded views or Rhino, which has kind of upped the game with the latest version by ba building in the cycles render. It's, it's a way better than it used to be, but it's still more flying the jet than not. And so why would somebody spend the money to, uh, in addition to their package that they need to get the job done, which you just spoke to, they've got to do the drawings, right? We've got to do all this stuff. Why spend the money on an additional package? Why Enscape even? Yeah, no, it's it's a really good question. And honestly, it's, it's a it's a very responsible question that I think every owner of a professional practice should should ask themselves because, um, again, from experience, the the margins at an architecture practice are, are not high. The fees yeah. are, I mean, no, I agree with you. I think architects have been unfortunately underpricing themselves for a long time. But that's you know that could be a whole another two hour discussion. I think yes, the, it could. <laughs> the, the the reason why uh, somebody should invest in something higher quality is is honestly just i think directly proportional to 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 how they see their standard of care for their clients mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and um when i was in practice i wanted to give my clients the the best the best that i could right the best within my skill set within my abilities whatever because it, it you know we're, we're also we're not doing this just for the clients right i mean we're building permanent things on the face of the planet that we all inhabit and it's worth it right. that these mm -hmm. spaces are good i mean i i forget exactly what the number is but we spend as humans something like 97.8 percent of our time indoors <laughs> that's rather yeah. significant right so i mean right. me as an as an architect i would rather think that we want to make the best spaces that we could that we can if not just for us, for, for future generations, because these are going to be on the planet for a very long time. So why should somebody spend a time, the, the time and, and the resources on a good design tool is, is simply to make better design and, and to make better design decisions. Because I think with, with more information and being able to generate that information a lot quicker and more effectively, then, then that leads to better design. So for me, that's really the the main thing is is as architects, we all want to make better buildings, and these tools help us do that. You can also look at it from a kind of a, a little bit of a colder or a detached point of view, which is simply to look at at the business case. I mean, uh, the time that you would spend to um, create something compelling for a client or for a presentation um, is, is not insignificant if you're not using some kind of of solution, whether it's real time or not. But um, I mean, and, and billable hours are, are, I mean, they are the way that you measure an architect's uh, business and value proposition. So um, it, it's a very, how do I say, easy is maybe the best word. It's a very easy way to introduce efficiency in your business um, from the perspective of a business owner. And I, I know it's only an economic perspective, but it's, it's not insignificant, you know, because mm -hmm. um, dollars and cents translate to hours and minutes and hours and minutes that could be invested in. And in, in other things, in, in catching things that might lead to a RFI in the field or a change order or something. And and for me, these are the things that architects should be spending their time on because that's where our experience in education um, makes us valuable. It's not in in, in making, um, you know, PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, I think a lot of times firms hire interns or emerging professionals and they'll do the visualization because they speak computer language you know i i say that in a very <laughs> dumb way but it's like they're tech they're the tech people right they're the ones who can prepare the images and and they will art, then the, the the seniors will art direct right and they'll stand over the shoulder and say no a little bit to the left no a little bit to the right move the sun move. and and so i think that so there's there's that kind of mentality but i think now the tools have gotten so good and so easy to use if you have the appropriate hardware to run it on to take away the pain of of running it on an underpowered machine that anybody like literally anybody can do this and i think that is is one of the big shifts that we've seen in the evolution of bringing real-time rendering to the masses in a much much bigger scale way which i i assume could only happen with the Enscape merger, or sorry, with the Chaos merger, because that is what's really, okay, number one, 
these products are already out there. They know how to get a product into AEC at scale. They're, they have the resources for a team to build better tools. And maybe you can just speak to that a, bit, a little bit and tell me if that's if my, my inclination is true there, because it seems to me like because they're complementary, because there's name recognition out there, there's already trust and relationships in the field when it comes to tool providers for visualization with a group like Chaos to bring that, you know, Enscape along under that umbrella and really help get it out there. Has that been significant for Enscape to get into the market in a much better way? I think, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of things that we've been able to um, share with one another. Um, and, and, and we can look at this in a lot of different ways. I mean, um, there's, of course, the opportunity to um, share technology, right, which is maybe kind of the, the low hanging fruit. I'll give you a very, mm -hmm. very direct example are um, we have these procedural clouds in Enscape, which are, well, they're procedural, right? So they're, they're, they're generated uh, through an algorithm. You, you don't need to um, use images or HDRs basically to, to create the scene. And um, guess what? It turns out that's actually quite exciting for, for film studios, a.k.a. clients of VRA Advantage, um, because now they don't have to spend all this time when they shoot a scene and then kind of be paint, painting in quotes uh, the shadows that match these clouds on the actual characters in the scene because the procedurally generated clouds basically allow you to pull that data and dynamically, computationally apply these shadows to um, to the characters in the scene. So that's, that's a, a, I think, an example of an exchange in the other way. Um, yeah. There's been many examples in, 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 in our direction as well, not just from a technology standpoint, but from a, a client standpoint as well. Um, we're able to, I think... Yeah, uh, tell our stories to to clients that previously would not have known either brand, um, and see if they find value in the solutions, which is which is awesome. And and ultimately, it's I think it's about just sharing knowledge, experience um, about how to to be more effective, right? Because ultimately, the goal is to solve real problems for real people. It doesn't matter if mm -hmm. they're 3D artists or architects, but as as a company, you know, as a portfolio yeah. of products. We need to make sure that what we're building is is solving product uh, solving problems for for real people out there doing doing real work. So um, it, it's been a great opportunity to share knowledge. I think back and forth, and honestly, there there's a lot more that that we can and should and will do, right? Um, but that's also, like you said, that's one of the benefits of of having that exposure. And you know, along the way, we also acquired a couple of other companies, Celindo, Axes. Um, those bring in a wealth of knowledge from totally different industries. I mean, Celindo's got the e-commerce um, and furniture side of the business uh, very well um, under comprehension. Axis is, is um, they they really know kind of the the animation system, the the state of the art scanning technology for for people. And again, completely different clients, completely different use cases a lot of the times. And when we're all together under one um, entity, we can share that knowledge and experience a lot more and we can work towards a common goal and be faster and more effective at it rather than, you know, trying to pursue the same things alone, basically. Yeah. Let's talk about your audience because for the longest time, Enscape was not available to a segment of that audience. I don't know how big that audience was, but I, I yeah. am, the Macintosh is near and dear to me. I, I am a tried and true Mac user. And so for the longest time, Enscape was not available to me, but now it is. So this is another thing that's happened since the last time that we've talked. And I know it has not been the easiest road for you to travel. Um, but I know that this has been something that you've been working really hard on. And so maybe like, let's just get into that part of the conversation. You can kick us off with like what, what that journey has been like since you originally decided to bring Enscape to Mac users and why you why you would even go there yeah yeah that's a it's 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 a heck of a story I'll, I'll tell you that um maybe I'll start with the why I mean why why do we want to do it you know the one of these other phrases that I always repeat like a, a bit of a broken record internally and externally is that our goal is to democratize uh, this technology to people, to projects, 
because again, kind of like I mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the goal is to design better buildings and we want to make sure that everybody has access to that. This shouldn't be this like exclusive thing that, you know, the top 1% of, of, of architecture firms can, can access. It should be something that anybody and everybody can access. So, you know, we always do this exercise of looking at what are the limiting factors that might prevent somebody from being able to um, leverage that, that power. And yeah, one of them, maybe one of the biggest ones is, is operating systems. So Mac, we identified, um, honestly, pretty early. I think I had joined shortly after our, our, um, our CEO, Christian Lang, and these discussions were kind of going on, but, but that was something that we identified right off the bat. And we didn't have, um, and of course you can never have like perfect numbers of how many people are, are using this or not using this, but, uh, we had some assumptions and we decided those are, are worth pursuing and pursue them we did and i think yeah it, it's it's been a bumpy road uh definitely i mean we we don't regret doing it of course because we can reach so many people but you know in, in the beginning we started with this uh, we started with good intentions and we started with something which was very ambitious uh the goal of basically building this thing in parallel to windows uh to the windows version and not slowing down the windows development which although ambitious um, and although we had good intentions, it, it didn't fully work out for us. We had um, begun working with an external partner who was uh, supposed to take that project. And, you know, unfortunately, the, um, well, the, the world underwent some changes. Uh, let's put it that way. Economic conditions were, were ebbing and flowing. Uh, at a certain point, the war in Ukraine started, which affected our partner. And, you know, at, at a certain point, we had to make the, the tough decision that due to these challenges, we just need to bring this project um, in-house and, and, and do it a different way. So we did that and it cost us, I think, some time. But I think that the value that we get in return is something uh, much better and something that's going to allow us to be more effective and efficient going forward. So basically what we did is rather than uh, going with the strategy of having these two separate code bases, uh, we came up with a way to have one code base that basically works across the platforms. And what that means is that now, after 4.0, of course, whatever feature we build for Windows or for Mac, it's going to be there for everybody. So we build one feature once. And, you know, in, in kind of the strategy that we were pursuing before, we would have had to build everything twice. Of course, I mean, that's twice the time, twice the people. And it it, it would have slowed us down in the long term. So um, we're, we're really excited to, to bring this thing to, to the market. We're excited to see what the reception is going to be like from the customers. I mean, the, the Mac version that's out there already is seeing some really, really um, heavy usage for, for a product that's so new. Um, and, and we're excited by that, of course. But we, we know that the full impact is going to come when we release 4.0, which is going to have um, feature parity with our Windows version, and it's you know it's going to be the one version kind of for the future, and we're gonna that's the foundation on top of which we'll build the subsequent version. So we're we're really excited to reach um, all these new users that are that are on the Mac platform. And is it now working with Rhino? Rhino eight. So I believe that's scheduled to release actually tomorrow on Wednesday the seventeenth. Oh, nice. Yes. Well, maybe that's something we could talk about then too. Is okay. so Enscape is a plug-in renderer for several different packages, right? And mm -hmm. so it works on Windows, it works in Revit and Rhino and SketchUp. Am I missing anything there? Are those the main the main players? Revit, Rhino, SketchUp, uh, Vectorworks, and Archicad, which are a bit more popular right. here on this side of the ocean, but yeah. I, and, and with small firm architects in the US, I, I imagine mm -hmm. a lot of people who want to get into BIM don't want to get into full expensive BIM <laughs> sure, <laughs> right? yeah, with, yeah. with Revit or Archicad. Uh, so there are quite a few small firm architects that I'm aware of using Vectorworks for sure. And so okay. that totally makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, to your point, though, I think it is a, a much bigger market on on that side of, of the world. But um, on the Mac side, we have we don't have Revit, right? But we have Archicad yeah. and we have Vectorworks and we have Rhino and we have SketchUp. And so maybe talk about how that works and, and what what it's like to actually use that. So so you you get you buy Enscape as a as a plugin renderer and then it just automatically installs plugins for whatever host packages you already have on your machine. That's exactly it, right? So with one Enscape license you get access to both operating systems. 
uh, Mac and Windows, and you also get access to all of the CAD plugins that we currently support. So nice. we, I mean, we we try to make it as easy as possible, and and you know, not create this confusing process where people have to basically do research and figure out, okay, what do I buy? What do I not buy? What do I need? What do I not need? So you buy once, and it works everywhere. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And yes, like you said, the only thing that's been missing so far is the, is the Rhino support on Mac. Uh, but with our preview release tomorrow on the 17th, that should be out there. And yes, there, there will be a subsequent kind of a, a full release. But, uh, you know, as, as you know, and some of our or some of your listeners already know, we, we regularly uplo upload preview releases, um, which kind of give a sneak peek and, and early access to some of the features that we're working on. Nice. So by the time people hear this episode, that date will have passed for sure. So yeah. when you say the 17th, you're talking about January 17th. Yes. That yes. where so Rhino 8 support. So Rhino previously worked uh, Rhino 7 and Enscape worked well together on Windows. Uh, there was no Rhino support on the Mac for Enscape yet. Yeah. And so with version 8 of Rhino coming out where McNeil's going through a, a similar thing as what you talked about, right, which was was uh, assimilating the code base so that when a feature comes out on on windows it also comes out on mac at the same time there's a lot of companies going through this and is that has that really been predicated on the release of apple silicon is that really where this is coming from because this was apple kind of basically forced everybody to move in a different direction when it came to graphics right with the with the metal instead of with the metal APIs instead of OpenGL, I know that there's been a lot of consternation about that as well. But it also was an opportunity to say, like, okay, this is a modern graphics system that we are we can now actually bet on, right? Because I think that was something that that was always a question mark when it came to developing mm -hmm. tools for the Mac, not just architectural tools, right? But graphics intensive tools on the Mac was like. How long is OpenGL going to last on the Mac because they're not showing a lot of love for it? And uh, that changed a while ago, yeah. right, where they where they completely stopped their love for OpenGL <laughs> and moved into this new direction. Was that a big impetus to actually go or, or was it just like, OK, green light, we need to move in this direction now because they're they're serious about it? I, I honestly think for us it was um, let, let's call it a. There were a couple of things that coincided um, and, and actually weren't necessarily intended to to so perfectly coincide. So um, historically, Enscape was based on OpenGL, but at one point we kind of, you know, we our engineers, when I say we, our engineers, uh, the smart people looked at this and they said, you know, this 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 doesn't really have a future. We, we want to move to to a new graphics API. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they chose Vulkan. Mm -hmm. which conveniently allows us to run on uh, Mac as well. And mm -hmm. we, we, it, it, how do I say, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we have to write native uh, metal code, luckily. Mm -hmm. um, it, it uses a, a framework, and I'm, I'm kind of I'm blanking on the name right now, unfortunately, but basically it, it allows the, um, the, the software to work on, on Mac as well. Not native metal but um, good enough. You know, when we did our performance tests, it was about what we expected. Uh, initially, we, we, we kind of had a little bit of concern that maybe um, through, this, um, through this added step that we would degrade performance a little bit, but it, it was what we expected. It was in line with what Apple put out as um, expectations when we're comparing M chips to, you know, NVIDIA GPUs. So that aligned nicely for us. And the last thing that aligned nicely for us was and this was actually kind of our, our big bottleneck, was actually the UI framework, right? Because mm -hmm. historically, as a Windows-only product, um, Enscape was built with uh, WPF, Windows Presentation Forms, and the W, the Windows being the key word there, that only works yeah. on Windows. And right. the first time we looked at this project, there wasn't anything that we saw as, as fully fit and ready to um, work as a cross-platform UI, right? And after that kind of delay happened with working with external partners and these economic conditions, um, there were other things out there that we could use. And what we're using now is, is a framework called Avalonia, which allows us to, um, yeah, have a cross-platform UI. And so these things kind of came together nicely, um, not, not originally planned. Like the Vulcan decision wasn't solely because we want to get on Mac. It was simply a, um, you know, we, we got to get rid of technical debt kind of decision. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And and so how long has that process been for you guys? How painfully long has that process been? 
been for you guys? It's been very long. I mean, I, I think we started the discussions when I when I first joined the company, which yeah. was around September, October of 2020. I forget exactly when we kicked off the project, but I mean, you know, I've been with the company roughly around three years, so it's it's been roughly around that much, right? Um, again, uh, longer than than we intended, absolutely. But I, I think that the solution that we're going to get out of it is going to be a better version than what we envisioned three years ago. Cool. And, and yeah. for me, the, the quality is the more, more important thing. This episode is made possible with support from Confluence. Picture this, October 2019, Lexington, Kentucky, the birthplace of Confluence, a place where tech leaders, AEC product developers, and practitioners came together for three transformative days. It was more than a conference. It was a confluence of ideas, discussions, and unforgettable social experiences. Since then, over 200 attendees have experienced the magic of Confluence. I've had the privilege of being part of three of these remarkable gatherings, two in Kentucky and one in Orange County each one a melting pot of learning, collaboration, and camaraderie around a topic shaping our industry. And now we're thrilled to announce the next regional Confluence event in April 2024 in the vibrant heart of New York City. This time, we dive deep into the realms of AI and machine learning, unraveling their mysteries and potentials in our industry. Are you interested in being part of this exciting journey to continue the conversation to shape the future? Visit the link in the show notes for more details. Confluence, where ideas flow, connections form, and the future of AEC technology is shaped one conversation at a time. My thanks to Confluence for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so let's talk about you. And I want to talk about this three years and the shift that, you know, the decision that you made, all of the regrets that you, you now have, I can clearly <laughs> see it on your face. Tell, tell me about that for you. Like, what was that like? So you you said you have a master's and a bachelor's in architecture, and yeah. you were working in a, a large firm, and you yeah. were on the technology side. I don't know how, if, if you got into the practice side at all. I mean, fill us in on those details. But then making the decision to move out of, you know, out of the profession into a more peripheral technology provider side of the profession, still still related to AEC for sure. But, you know, and in that in the, I make the distinction of working in the profession to working on the profession, you're, the things yeah. that you're working on, the thing, the tools that you're trying to bring to make AEC better, to make to help firms succeed at their goals, I think is is a valuable decision that a lot of architects not only have made, but but should continue to make, because when we're working in firms, it's so isolated. It's so much just about that one firm. There's a lot of protection. There's a lot of barriers around what's going on in that firm. And there's not a lot of sharing, although I, I do see trends in the other direction. I, I see more sharing happening now than, than ever before. But talk about what that's been like for you, because I, I wonder, you know, I, I, I know that there's people who have made that decision and they like to hear how other people have done it. But there's people yeah. considering making that decision, too. Yeah. And so what what's your experience been like? Yeah, I'll I'll well, it's it's been a, a definitely a lengthy experience that I'll, I'll try and be brief but informative. I think when when I was done with my graduate degree, I I was very lucky to 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 get a position offered at at Kieran Timberlake, uh which has always been kind of one of my um, you know, shining stars, my my idols, my heroes in the profession, right? So it was like this this very special moment that I was that I had a chance to work there. And when I started there, I was um, I was I was a staff architect. I I wasn't really mm -hmm. having anything to do with the technology side. But okay. um, again, Kieran Timberlake, very being the special practice that it is, was uh, also filled with a lot of very uniquely talented people, and they had a dedicated research group um, with a lot of very very bright and interested folks that were working on all these you know uh, crazy cool projects. And over time, I I kind of got 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 sucked into that you know i was it all started with a problem that i was doing for the university of washington actually we were we were trying to comply with these local regulations and um i couldn't make it work i couldn't make it work so i i basically buckled down and, and spent some long nights to try and uh, build this uh, python based tool to to help me optimize uh, a zoning algorithm to see if we can do it and to finally you know put this to rest 
because, you know, after spending countless nights playing with Excel formulas, I, at one point I realized, hey, you know, I, I didn't spend seven years in architecture school to fiddle uh, in Excel. I, I want to make buildings <laughs> and, and make good spaces for people, right? So, yeah. and that was really the starting point. And, and afterwards, again, I, I was lucky that I, I had an uh, opportunity to, to work directly in the research team. And I had a lot of uh, uh, people that supported me along the way. Um, I think they're, they're still at KT, Christopher Connock. Um, the, he's the director of design computation there. Billy Faircloth, she's a, a partner and the, the director of research. Um, they, they supported me and supported my curiosity and, and always put projects in front of me that, that would help me grow. And over time, then I think I, it was more of a personal thing, but I, I wanted to move back closer to my family and, um, and my wife's family in, in Columbus, Ohio, um, which is when I started working at NBBJ. And again, I was very lucky. I had some fantastic mentors. Mark Seep uh, was, was working there at the time. I think he's with Gensler now. Um, yeah, Paul Odsley, our CTO, and, and Nate Holland, who was at the time the director of, of, of um, innovation. So, yeah, and that was a completely different scale of project, right? It was very different, very different clients, very different opportunities, global team. And it helped me learn more and more. And, and at that point, I think I was focused really full time on the technology side of things. And I guess over time, what I what I realized is that um, I'm, I'm more effective in this role. I mean, there's a lot of people that are better architects than I am, but I am a really good supporter of those people because I understand the problems. I understand their needs. And basically, by teaching myself, um, you know, software development, I could articulately respond to those needs in a way that somebody without that industry knowledge um, couldn't really. Mm -hmm. And then basically to bring this all to a close, the pandemic kicked off. There was, you know, economic turmoil everywhere. And for some reason, I made uh, the, the seemingly crazy decision to leave a very stable job in a firm with 75 years of history to join this. Uh, what I thought at the time was basically a, a small startup on the other side of the world. But um, uh, yeah, uh, it, it was also a good time because the Enscape was transitioning. The two founders were stepping down. Uh, Enscape had hired a new CEO, Christian Lang, um, who turned out also, again, to be a fantastic mentor and a fantastic teacher who always put the right opportunities in front of me to to learn more and challenge myself. And and I think looking back on those three years, I, I have absolutely zero regrets, actually exactly the opposite, because yeah. there's so much that I've learned along the way. And I, I really do think that in this role, I can support the profession a lot better than I could um, just as an architect, because again, there's simply a lot of people that are better at me uh, in, in, in design, um, but I can mm. support them. And I'm, I would love to do that. I love doing that. That's, that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I I appreciate you telling that story because I think that is something that people want to hear. And it, it isn't always the Cinderella version that you just painted because I think it really has worked out really well. I mean, you've just found a really great fit and it doesn't always work like that. But when it does, I do feel like it is an opportunity to serve the profession in a very, in a great way that the profession really needs, whether the profession sees it or not, <laughs> whether they understand it yeah. from that direction or not. Uh, like we really need more people working on it at a larger scale, like stepping back and, and surveying the whole thing, what's going on and what are the issues that, what are the problems that need to be solved? What are the tools that need to be made that can apply to a lot bigger of an audience than just one team or one firm? Um, I mean, we've seen it in technology, right? Every firm, for the most part, is making very similar tools to solve very similar problems, right? And they're doing that on their own, and it never gets beyond that, or it gets deprecated or forgotten. You know, uh, I, I'm I'm thinking of of some some articles that have been written on on LinkedIn about technical debt and uh, tools that have been lost and forgotten about and no longer supported. And every firm deals with this, and they're not set up to deal with that because it's a completely different problem than what they're getting paid to solve for their clients. Uh, and so it, it is kind of an interesting shift that we're seeing because technology has enabled people to move just outside of the traditional role of an architect to work in other ways that, that serve the entire profession. So you've now moved to Germany, you've 
moved your family over there and, and you're working for, you know, out of, out of that office, what, what has that shift been like? And, and what has that opportunity been like? Because again, like, you know, if, if you're, it's very hard to find a firm that you can even work remotely for in the U S and, and if you do, you're going to maybe move to another state. I mean, if you don't, you're going to move to a di maybe a different state or, you know, f practices are very, you know, regionally based to moving across the country and working for a, a software company that, that serves, you know, international clients. Yeah, it's been, a, it, it's been a, well, it's been a good experience, right? But, but definitely not easy. I mean, moving to another yeah. country is never easy. Um, I should know because I did it once upon a time moving to the U.S. Uh, I think that was 1999 or so. Um, <laughs> and it's never easy. It wasn't easy then. It's not easy now. I, I have the bit of advantage um, that I've worked in Germany before uh, as an mm -hmm. architect, of course. But um, mm -hmm. so, you know, I think a lot of the things weren't so alien to me as they are to other people. And I was also quite lucky in that since I am, I mean, I, I was born a European citizen, so I, I didn't have all this other kind of legal and bureaucratic stuff to deal with in moving over here. But, you know, picking up your life and, and going somewhere else is, is never easy. But again, I, looking at it today, I think it's, it's absolutely worth it because this is, where, um, this is where my team is. This is where the bulk of, of chaos is. Enscape is entirely located here in Karlsruhe. Um, the biggest office of, of chaos is in, is in my hometown, which is Sofia, Bulgaria. And yeah, we've got offices in Prague and in Denmark, um, all over the place. But it, it's all here on this side of the ocean because, you know, it, it got to be it got to a point where when I was working remotely, I was basically flying across the ocean once or twice a month. And that round trip was I mean, it wasn't just killing me, but it was also really affecting my my productivity. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely the right decision. It's it's nice to be so close to the people and to be able to support them much better than I can, you know, several time zones away. So it's and, and it's great too that I had that opportunity, right? Because Christian Lang and, and our board could have simply said, Yeah, man, sorry, it's it's cheaper for us if you stay over there. Um but right. but they did everything in their power to to help me do this and, and I think yeah, if if I was to ask them today, I, I don't think they would regret it either. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I mean it's really interesting to hear how you've kind of done this big circle, right? You've gone from living in Europe, moving to America in 99, going through the process of school and working in medium and large size firms, and then moving back out of tech and then moving back to close to home, right? I mean, I think that that's, that's really a, a neat journey. So I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's, it's, it's interesting to hear other people's experiences and perspectives and, and you, you've never been the guy who doesn't share his opinion like you you've you're an outspoken guy and and i appreciate that you're you're i do miss the beard i mean i think i think i took you a little more seriously when you had the beard but i don't know if it fits <laughs> in, in, in in germany <laughs> i gotta blend in a little bit come on i gotta blend in <laughs> uh, is there anything that that we're missing in this conversation that that you really feel like uh the audience needs to hear about what what am i missing um, oh, missing. I, I don't know. I mean, there, there's so many topics that one could get into. Um, I mean, I, I think we had a lot of, of interesting points in, in kind of the, the different, the, the span of time between their last conversation and now, um, looking ahead to, to the next version of Venscape, kind of what's next for us as a portfolio. Um, we talked about the product positioning, which I think is very, very important and something we're going to continue focusing on, especially now that we're part of a bigger group. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of anything that's uh, really burning and, and could really add a lot. Well, we're, we're definitely steering clear so far. I, I'm opening the crack of the door a little bit here about about AI and visualization. Like this has been mm. everybody's watching this. Um, any any kind of parting thoughts on that? Because I, yeah. this this we could open the floodgates and, and go down the road of, of this. But but I don't know if that's appropriate right now. But I, I am interested from your perspective, um, what what's interesting to you about yeah. where visualization is heading with a little bit of a, a tinkling, a twinkling of, of AI, you know, just, just it's looming or all around yeah. us. Yeah. It's, it's a hot topic. Right. And, and I think, um, everybody's talking about it with good reason. I'll, I, I think in, in the briefest of terms, what I can say from my perspective is 
I, I actually like to quote our um, our chief product officer, Cam Starr, um, who's who's been a super super great addition to our team. I think his one year anniversary is coming up now, so it, nice. it feels like he just joined yesterday. But he's he's a great guy, and the sentence that he uses is. Uh, when it comes to AI is that, you know, we don't want to replace the artist. We want to make a better paintbrush. And, you know, we've got a lot of exciting things that we're developing internally right now. Nothing's ready for, for a public showcase. But it's always with that perspective. It's like I, I don't want to take the artist. And artist here is a metaphor, right? Architect, a designer, whatever. It's not about eliminating their power of creativity or taking agency away from them. Um, it's about identifying these tasks that are... Um, difficult or time consuming or or simply not worth the time of an architect because kind of like I mentioned before our our biggest value our experience our training is in is in making buildings that are you know uh, legally compliant that are good for the people living in them and that are beautiful as well right so um, when it comes to visualization workflow there's no shortage of of tasks we can identify that we could um, really speed up with with something like AI so that's really our, our philosophy for, for looking at this is maximize, retain creative agency for the people wielding these tools, uh, but make these tools uh, basically powerful enough to allow them to still express themselves, but maybe in a quicker or a more effective way. Um, and, and as a company, I think that's, that's, that's the philosophy that um, we embody. And that, that's one that I personally agree with as well. Um, I know there's a lot of other projects here and there across the the broad tech industry um that are kind of thinking in a different direction and that's that's mm -hmm. just not what we want to do it's yeah, yeah not a focus i feel like enscape did that it gave what i would consider superpowers to people who have definitely lived through the transition of the old way of doing it to the you know the new way of doing it where a tool when a tool can do that like it it reinvigorates the user in a way that is kind of indescribable. It's like it, you actually feel like you have superpowers. And when it, I mean, that's what humans are, they, they use tools for leverage to accomplish a task, right? And software is an, an absolutely incredible tool to be able to do that. And as architects, uh, it, it is important to embrace tools that can give you superpowers because yeah. everybody else is getting, like you're, you're talking about democratizing tools for that that means available to anyone and everyone at the it, it's table stakes it becomes table stakes right these no longer are menu items that a client chooses to pay for like they are part of the process now it, as soon as it becomes like a decision making tool along the way and you really leverage it for that and you realize the power of that and it, it's like no this is just how we work now this is no longer an add-on that comes at some point in the process and the most successful tools in my mind are the ones that give you those superpowers as early as possible and you get to differentiate yourself through that in the beginning but only for a short amount of time because the whole idea behind democratizing tools is that everybody is eventually going to adopt those and so you have kind of a first mover advantage sometimes, and you know, when, when you pick the right thing at the right time. I think AI is kind of like that right now, right? There are people who are feeling like they've got the superpowers and they're able to use those. And I think as we see all these tools converge in many different ways, right? We're seeing it happen all over the place. That's where, I, I, that's kind of like a sweet spot for a lot of people. And so it, it's it's always fun to kind of keep our eyes on what's going on out there and watching what companies like Enscape are doing with that. I'm at AU going to the booth, talking with Cam and Roderick and Dan, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of neat stuff going on at Enscape. I'm really, I, I'm excited about what you guys are working on. And I think, you know, it's like picking and choosing the right ways to implement these into these the tools that you already make are it's a really smart way to move forward so i'm excited to see where this goes um, from from the enscape perspective and uh I, I just appreciate you taking the time to hang out and tell that story today tell your story a little bit more and uh and thank you for bringing enscape to the mac i think I, i'm very excited about that as well oh we're excited as well yeah and, and hopefully a lot of a lot of other people are going to be excited so we're very much looking forward to it um, happening, happening soon, uh, sooner, the better, honestly, couldn't come soon enough. It's going to be a huge milestone for us internally as well. 
um, we'll be sure to celebrate in some some way. But um, yeah, nice. also thank you for for the invite. It's always nice to be able to uh, connect with with the community that I was a little bit closer to before. But um, yeah, yeah, these days I'm I'm a little bit uh, yeah uh, outside of outside of the circle as it were. But um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some stories with with everybody that they might not uh, get otherwise. All right. Well, hopefully we'll talk again, and it won't be two years away. And uh, we'll be we'll be talking about what's what's new at Enscape. So thanks very much, Peter, for taking the time today. Appreciate it. Thank you.